It's my pleasure to announce the next speaker, Annie Oak. The title of her talk is Building Risk Reduction and Community Safety Systems in Festival Environments. Annie is one of the founders of the Women Visionary Congress that has uh, held several conferences in the Bay Area. The, those were truly incredible memories. Um, I participated in a few and they were just incredible spaces. And she's also a human rights activist and ha produces big parties uh, in the Bay Area. And she has been developing these protocols, a uh, topic that doesn't receive a lot of attention. So her presentation is most welcome. Please welcome her. <clears throat> Thanks, everybody. I'm Annie Oak. I'm delighted to be here. I live in the Haight-Ashbury neighborhood of San Francisco, and I bring you greetings from our sub-district of the Bay Area psychedelic community. You'll notice I'm not wearing tie-dye. <clears throat> there is plenty of that left on Haight Street for the tourists, but my fellow residents of Haight-Ashbury and the Bay Area psychedelic community as a whole are the heirs of a proud tradition of love, political activism, and free expression that changed global culture more than 50 years ago. After years of suffering under the drug war, people now walk down my street smoking and vaping cannabis without worrying about being roughed up and arrested. And that's real progress we all make happen together. Mm -hmm. These days, the psychedelic community that I'm part of is no longer a subculture. People who use psychedelics are the mainstream culture. They use these substances to enhance their creativity, for healing and spiritual benefit, to enhance their erotic lives, to reduce stress, appreciate the natural world, and to have fun. Psychedelics are used for lots of reasons. Many of us in our psychedelic community are in the tech business, and we create the digital tools and online experiences that you use every day. The tech industry from its inception has been deeply influenced by psychedelic experiences that allow people to generate new ideas and imagine the future. I'm here to talk with you today about how my culture creates psychedelic risk reduction and community safety systems in social environments. I prefer the term risk reduction because harm reduction implies that all use is harmful. I don't believe that all use of psychedelics is harmful. While the use of psychedelic materials in research, therapeutic, and medical environments is now receiving a lot of attention in the press and popular culture, the majority of people who use these substances will not be ingesting them in a controlled research or therapeutic setting. Only a relatively small number of people around the world will have that opportunity and the resources to engage in those forms of healing. Most people will be having, and have always had, psychedelic experiences in social settings where they engage in unsupervised self-experimentation. Could we say that all? Just a moment. Unsupervised <laughs> self-experimentation. Thank you. The recent media attention has, of course, prompted a lot of interest. Mm -hmm. The recent media attention about the healing powers of psychedelics, popular books, and publicity by psychedelic research groups such as MAPS is prompting an even greater number of people to become curious about psychedelics and procure these substances on the black market and use them in social settings. The psychedelic party scene in the Bay Area and around the world continues to grow and reflect a type of intense eagerness to test the possibilities of healing with psychedelics through unsupervised self-experimentation. Now, I'm a science journalist by training and a human rights activist by inclination, but I became an event producer to make sure that there were many voices in the discussion around psychedelics and that people exploring these experiences were treated with dignity. I believe that people organizing social gatherings, parties, festivals, conferences, have an ethical duty to design these environments in ways that uphold best practices for health and safety. 
I also believe that people who promote and proselytize the use of psychedelics for therapeutic and healing purposes, and those who stand to make a great deal of money from these therapies, also have a responsibility to help support, uphold, and develop these best practices for risk reduction in social settings. Now, when I talk about risk reduction, Thank you. When I talk about risk reduction, I am not just talking here about paying attention to set and setting, although that's very important, as many of us know. I'm talking about measures that take into account the potential for misadventure during the transformative psychedelic experience, the potential for overdose, accidental poisoning by adulterated substances, psychological and emotional challenges during the psychedelic journey, and the potential to be impacted by abuse of power, sexual harassment, coercion, and assault in environments where psychedelics are used. All this mixed together with opportunities for transcendent joy, music, dancing, interactions with art, deep conversation, friendship, sex, ritual, and transformation. The entire Dionysian experience that people have sought out for centuries and will continue to pursue even if that is sometimes seen as an impediment to the public relations strategy of scientific and research communities. Although sometimes it feels like the research community is getting more Dionysian and the party scene is becoming more rule-based. How ironic. <laughs> I don't believe that there is any one single psychedelic community. There are many such communities around the world. So what I mean by psychedelic community in this talk are people who ingest psychedelics because they have access to these materials. Psychedelic communities may think that they are special, but psychedelic communities are no different than the cultures they are part of, and they reflect all the social imbalances and inequalities that presently exist. They are no different except for one important exception. Members of psychedelic communities typically use psychedelics, and these tools have informed how we approach issues such as safety, conflict resolution, and social dynamics. So I would like to share with you today some of the risk reduction approaches that members of my community advocate and have adapted in social settings. I want to begin by saying that in my culture, we pay attention to history, and we listen to wisdom from our elders. The psychedelic culture that emerged in Haight-Ashbury more than 50 years ago brought forth philosophies and community institutions that changed how we think about these problems. Together with a group of wise people from around the world, I co-authored a book called The Manual of Psychedelic Support. This book describes how to set up and run compassionate care services for people having difficult drug experiences. Chapter one, which I wrote, the history of psychedelic care services gives due credit to our foremothers and forefathers who pioneered these services. So what did these groups do? They created teams of people who roamed festival sites looking for participants who needed assistance. They created care spaces to provide direct support for people having different psych difficult psychedelic experiences. And they provided medical care and developed methods that helped people approach these potentially challenging moments as possible opportunities for growth, knowledge, and personal transformation. So these models of care existed for our community of contemporary psychonauts when we first began thinking about risk reduction measures. As it turns out, women played central roles in many groups that historically provided risk reduction services. This is also true of organizations that have emerged to provide risk reduction services in the last 20 years. Groups like the Cosmic Care team at the Boom Festival in Portugal, Cosmic Aid that provides these services in the UK, the psychedelic nurses that provide care at festivals in France and Switzerland, the Full Circle Tea House, which I launched as an art project at Burning Man in 2011, the Black Rock Rangers, Green Dot Ranger team, and their sanctuary space, which served the Burning Man community, and the Zendo Project, sponsored by MAPS, which started at Burning Man in 2012, which has a very able team of women and men and people of all genders. So women have played central roles organizing and leading these projects, and the inclusion of more women in leadership roles within the psychedelic community is an important part of making sure that risk reduction gets the attention it deserves. The very act of including more women leaders is itself a form of risk reduction. Mm -hmm. 
If integration is the goal of psychedelic experience, gender integration should be the goal of therapeutic, investigative, social, and cultural experiences with psychedelics. By empowering women leaders in the psychedelic community, you reduce the risk of skewing the larger conversation about psychedelics, popular histories about psychedelics, which often don't include the voices of women, research agendas, and the aggregation of knowledge. And now you help prevent the kind of social pathologies that we now see in executive, legislative, and judicial branches of government where there is an imbalance of power between women and men in leadership. Fifteen years ago, when I was covering psychedelic conferences as a reporter, I noticed that there were relatively few women speaking. I do believe in the old adage, if you want to change the world, throw a better party. <laughs> so in 2007, I produced an event called the Women's Visionary Congress, or the WVC. Yep. And we invited 25 women who were then being largely left out of the larger discussions about psychedelics to speak about their psychedelic research, healing practices, art, and activism, including Kai Wingo, who then invited me to her conference. Hmm. She was an amazing woman, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> In 2008, a group of psychedelic women elders and I formed a nonprofit called the Women's Visionary Council, also known as the WVC, the first women's psychedelic nonprofit, which was modeled a bit on the Girl Scout Council because we were all former Girl Scouts <laughs> and because <laughs> we felt like scouts on the frontiers of consciousness. And for the next 10 years, 10 years, we produced the Women's Congress and other smaller events in the US and Canada, including a memorable event here in New York City in 2016. We will hold the next Women's Congress in the spring of 2019, and all of this material I'm talking about will be posted on the WVC website for you to read if you wish. After years of organizing the Women's Congress and promoting the work of those who spoke there, to other event producers and organizations, we began to see progress in the number of women asked to present at conferences, the number of female researchers associated with MAPS, the Hefta Research Institute, and other groups, many of whom I am pleased to see here. We saw greater recognition of women in other fields of inquiry, and we have a sense of satisfaction that the community we built around the WVC was able to contribute to that cultural shift. But while we celebrated and encouraged the women coming up through the ranks of research and medicine, activism and artistic expression, and are optimistic that the number of women and the opportunities afforded to them will continue to increase, we also saw the shadow side of the psychedelic community. Encouraged to speak out about their psychedelic experiences and investigation, women from around the world began to contact us and also present information at our conference about abusive experiences they encountered in psychedelic ceremonies or while working with therapists and other healers who use psychedelics. We began hearing stories about women being harassed, assaulted, coerced, and abused by people who called themselves shamans or counselors or therapists. We also heard from men and women who witnessed these events and were traumatized by that, and men and people of all genders who also experienced these abuses. Researchers who presented at the WVC began to document these abuses, especially incidents that occurred during ayahuasca ceremonies that were then beginning to be mass marketed to people in the US and elsewhere. One of the things that is unique about the community of people who run, the community of women who run the WVC, and I want to say that all of our events are open always to people of all genders, but the women who run the WVC on the board, while some of us are academic researchers, our approach is more pragmatic than academic. The WVC is an educational nonprofit organization and we have a mandate to educate. So in 2014, we published a series of safety tips for those who participate in psychedelic ceremonies. These tips are totally relevant to those working with therapists, psychiatrists, and other kinds of healers. Here are some of our suggestions, which you can read on the WVC website under the resources tab. These tips have been translated and reposted to many other websites around the world and are worth repeating now, four years after we wrote them. They're applicable to people of all genders and many of them just reflect common sense. Number one, work with women. 
support female ceremonial leaders or consider working in all female groups or with facilitators who work in male-female pairs as many therapists engaged in clinical trials do. Consider due diligence, check out the reputation of the shaman, therapist, or healer you are working with. Carefully consider the quality and dosage of the substance being dispensed and its effect on past participants. Consider ingesting at the lowest dosage offered. Check out the safety of the ceremonial or therapeutic site. Secure safe lodging, especially if you are traveling to an event outside your home country. Participate in local ceremonies or therapies where practitioners can be held accountable by laws in your jurisdiction. Journey with friends. Attend the ceremony with trusted friends and cultivate a social support network. Develop a safety plan and check-ins with your support network before and after the session. Identify accountability mechanisms for the shaman or healer or therapist you are working with. If necessary, ask for help, both from facilitators and internal spiritual resources. Cultivate good physical, emotion, emotional, and psychic boundaries. Set clear intentions. Decide what you want out of the experience. Strengthen yourself. Cultivate your health and well-being before the session. Focus inward. Be wary of physical contact with others during the session, especially other ceremony participants. And evaluate touch. If a facilitator touches you during the session, evaluate if that encounter feels sexual. Refuse to be victimized. Take time to integrate after the ceremony. Check in after the session with facilitators and express both positive and negative emotions. Protect your personal space, especially sexual or romantic overtures, after the session when you may be especially open and vulnerable. Examine consensual sex. Consensual encounters between participants and facilitators occur, and they may make the participant feel special. But these relationships imply an imbalance of power that have the potential to be coercive and abusive. Consider that the standard, the, that the professional ethical standard for therapists in the US is a complete ban on intimate relationships with a former client for two years after the conclusion of their therapeutic work. Honor gradual emotions in the days, weeks, or months after the sessions and convey these feelings to facilitators. Offer a review of your experience that can benefit other participants in the future, include both positive and negative reviews, give thanks to healers whose actions reflect the highest degree of integrity and ethics, and give thanks to the men in the community who support these measures to people of all genders who stand up for the dignity of the people engaged in these transformative experiences. While offering these practical tips for people who seek out psychedelic ceremony and therapies, members of the WVC community also began to see other evolving safety concerns. The opioid epidemic was beginning to have a large impact on the health and well-being of people worldwide, especially women. Between 1999 and 2016, overdose deaths from prescribed opioids increased by 404% for men and 583% for women. In 2016, a study found that emergency medical services were three times less likely to administer the life-saving drug naloxone, also known as Narcan, to women experiencing an opioid overdose that ultimately killed them. In our community, we also saw an increasing number of overdoses from other substances as well including psychedelics and accidental poisonings from adulterated substances, especially substances cut with the synthetic opioid fentanyl. In 2017, the board of the WVC decided to pause from producing the Women's Congress and develop less expensive, more inclusive, and accessible workshops that focused on safety. We raised funding for and developed a series of free trainings that taught what we considered to be the three most important skills for people who use psychoactive substances. Number one, how to administer naloxone or Narcan, which blocks the effects of opioids, especially in cases of overdose. We distributed hundreds and hundreds of naloxone kits at no cost to people receiving this training.
We also taught people how to properly use a milligram scale and do volumetric measurement to actu accurately calculate dosage and prevent overdose. And finally, we teach people how to commercially use available reagent testing kits to test for the presence of potentially deadly adulterants and reduce risk for misidentified substances. We began doing naloxone training at festivals like Burning Man and hosting risk reduction workshops at public venues, private homes, and even at places like the Internet Archive in San Francisco where I think we challenged their techno-libertarian motto of universal access to all knowledge. <laughs> in four years during which we have been doing these workshops, we have received no opposition only support for caring deeply about the health and safety of our community. We also know that we, as WBC board members, are presentable, relatively privileged white women, and we use that privilege, which other people do not have, to generate support for this work. While doing these risk reduction workshops, it became clear that supporting risk reduction at festivals and events presented special challenges that require that we use our creative skills. Some years ago, I was part of a volunteer crew organized by MAPS to help staff the sanctuary space at Burning Man, which was started by the Black Rock Rangers. These rangers are participants who volunteer a portion of their time at Burning Man in service of the safety and well-being of the Burning Man community. And the sanctuary is a place where participants receive focused care for difficult psychedelic or psychological experiences. Now, we all learn valuable lessons about how to provide this care while serving in this space, but the rangers discovered that some of the volunteers were conducting intentional psychedelic journeys in this space, which was not the intention of the space, and reestablished control by requiring all of us to become rangers if we wish to continue this work. Most of the MAPS volunteers chose not to do this, but I was among a small group that did, and as a result received very valuable training in how to not only create care spaces, but also train and organize a team of rangers. But the rangers were not an ideal fit for me. I do not look good in a uniform. There were elements of the command structure which made me uneasy, and the ranger culture was largely centered around alcohol. The rangers run two bars at Burning Man. There are many bars at Burning Man, all offering free alcohol, which is part of their gifting culture. Now, we all know that alcohol and psychedelics is an often unhealthy combination. People who use psychedelics often don't necessarily want to hang out in bars. It's a suboptimal vibe. <laughs> <laughs> so in 2011, I decided to create a piece of psychedelic collaborative community art called the Full Circle Tea House, where people could rest and hydrate and be welcome in social space that address some of the challenges that people encounter in festival environments, loneliness, dehydration, and exhaustion. We offered tea and empathy, water, soft pillows, and if you needed it, and still need it, focused support 24 hours a day throughout the duration of the event. We serve herbal and black teas in a modified style based on traditional Chinese gung fu tea service. If you are altered and finding it a little difficult to use words, the very act of being offered a teacup, receiving it, drinking the tea, putting down your cup for a refill brings you into connection with others and back into your body. A crew of wonderful volunteers now run and staff the Full Circle Tea House, and they've been doing this for seven years, bringing it to Burning Man and many other festivals and parties. The Tea House was also consciously created as a piece of open source culture that could be easily and cheaply replicated by others, and now there are many similar tea houses that serve as the social center of psychedelic gatherings around the world. Thank you. So when I started the tea house, Rick Doblin asked me, whose permission did you get to start a tea house? <laughs> and I said, permission? <laughs> oh, Rick. I said, if you regard your work as art and risk reduction is an art, you don't need permission to create a new service or a piece of art, right? <laughs> 
And Rick said, okay, maybe we should start a, a, a care space too and call it something like the Zendo. And I said, you know, Rick, I think that's a great idea. You go do that. And, and while you're at it, get some women on your board, please. We <laughs> yeah. We will respect you and your efforts a whole lot more if you get some female leadership on your board, and I'm very pleased to say that, that has finally happened. Hurrah. <clears throat> and now the Zendo serves people at festivals and gatherings around the world. I have served as a Zendo trainer and volunteered for the men events when I'm not running a tea house. So there we were, running tea houses at social events, helping people form other tea houses, advising people about safety and psychedelic ceremonies and therapeutic environments, running risk reduction workshops. And people who organize large social events where people use psychedelics to enhance their experiences began to approach me and other elders in our community for advice. They asked a very sensible question. What best practices should we follow to best support the health and safety of participants at our events? And so we reached into our magic knapsacks and offered up all the advice that I've been presenting here. Let's review. One, listen to your elders and learn from the wisdom and the work of those who came before you. Integrate your social environments with people from all generations. Ensure that women are involved in leadership as business partners, board members, principal investigators, academic chairs, etc. Be open to all systems of inquiry and knowledge about both qualitative quantitative, and traditional ways of knowing. This is especially important because women are more engaged in numbers in qualitative research. Include education about consent in your community and at community events. We're seeing more of this happen. It makes us very happy. Before your event, teach drug safety skills such as the administration of naloxone, the proper use of milligram scales, volumetric measuring, and reagent testing kits the test for adulterants. Make access to such testing available at your events through groups such as Dance Safe, which has provided drug education in festival environments for decades. Remove alcohol from your event. Hmm. By any measure of health and safety, alcohol is an inferior drug. <laughs> right? It's not good for you physically, and it increases the chances for conflict and aggression. Because the entertainment industry is based on the model of alcohol sales, be prepared to make less money from your event. Create a comfortable tea house that offers free tea, water, resting space, social interaction, and focused support. Put your own cultural spin on your tea house to help attract and build a community of tea servers. Develop a care space and a crew of rangers who can provide support for participants at your event. Develop an in-house safety crew. Certainly, you can hire the Zendo or outside security services, but consider the value of recruiting and training these people from within your community. If you develop this capacity in-house, recruit the kindest, calmest, most capable, and respected members of your community to fill these roles and help enforce your values from within. Of course, you can also recruit people who have received training from the Zendo, the Black Rock Rangers, and other groups. And the number of well-trained people is growing all the time. But monopolies on care are not healthy for markets or social ecosystems. Consider holding private events where you must be sponsored to attend. Communities that run sex parties have pioneered this form of positive social engineering. If your sponsor is responsible for your behavior and may be removed from the party list if you misbehave, new participants are more accountable. You don't want to make your friends look bad by being a jerk. Engage with artists in your community to create immersive narratives that bring people on transformational journeys through art and financially supports the artists in your community. Don't take yourselves too seriously. Remember the prankster tradition and feel free to satirize your own culture, economic, and political systems. People really need that these days as a form of release. Remove yourself from social media. Consider a ban on all references to your event on social media. I know this is kind of radical, but I believe in radical resilience. 
I read Facebook posts from others and sometimes promote public events there. It's useful for that purpose. But I very seldom post on my personal page. I don't think it's a productive environment for all communities or community discussions. I think Facebook is a form of self-surveillance. Don't run your community life on an insecure advertising platform that sells your data. Mm -hmm. Develop zones of privacy around your event. Consider banning photographs and mentions on social media or develop a protocol for asking permission before you take or post photographs. I think that people have a right to transformative experiences in social spaces without appearing on people's Instagram feeds. Hmm, yeah. Respect the people in the communities around you. If you are organizing an event, be respectful to those who run the venue and live in the community. The cleaners, the waiters, the taxi, lift, and Uber drivers. Be a good psychedelic citizen. This is really important. I want to you know, focus on this because we have a duty to bring forward the best parts of who we are as a community and be respectful to everybody in that community. Train and empower risk reduction activists inside your community. There are now whole communities of risk reduction activists who carry forward the ideas I have presented here. Pass along that knowledge. Don't be too attached to any particular party or event or your role in that event. Stay detached from your ego if possible. There are substances that can help you with that. <laughs> Remember that party scenes follow a cycle. They often get larger and larger when they attract too much attention or interpretation or scrutiny. They sometimes close and others arise. Don't be too attached. Keep events open to interpretation so people can project their own narratives and ideas on them. Don't be didactic. Develop protocols to help prevent and address abuses of power sexual harassment, coercion, and assault. This is essential to creating safe communities, and I will end with a collection of protocols that the communities I work with use. I think that this is perhaps the largest challenge in developing psychedelic risk and community safety systems. So I want to review some protocols with dealing for, with the abuse of power, sexual harassment, coercion, and assault that I have used in my own community and pass along to people in other communities. One, it's important that many members of the psychedelic community understand that their fellow members do not always trust law enforcement to report these kinds of incidents. If someone wants to press charges in an assault case that occurs in your community, that's their right and this should be supported. But many communities and groups can't afford to hire lawyers and legal mediators also to settle these disputes. And so I argue for creating internal systems of community accountability in addition to supporting people if they wish to engage in the criminal justice system or work with lawyers. As a result, I think it's very important that communities of all kinds, especially communities where psychedelics are used, develop a set of shared values and be prepared to address abuses that occur. For instance, you could say, it's important to me that nobody is sexually assaulted at my event. And we add a sentence to the bottom of many emails, and people do this at other events that say something like, make sure every yes is a hell yes. Psychedelics can enhance sexual encounters. Establish enthusiastic consent as a value for your community. Empower people within your community to uphold these values. Determine who are your leaders and ask them to lead. That's really important. The founders and board members of private businesses, nonprofits, and other organizations have a legal duty to act as leaders, and they are well within their legal rights to make decisions that reflect the values of your and their communities. And decide whether you will consider anonymous accusations that are known to you, but perhaps not known to the person being accused. That is a decision each community must make. Create a mediation team. Recruit people from your community who have been trained as mediators, therapists, counselors, social workers, etc., and develop a protocol for them to review conflicts and potentially mediate between those making accusations and the accused. 
cultivate relationships with therapeutic practitioners. When I have conversations with people about sexual coercion, harassment, and assault, I always offer to refer both the accused and the accuser to professional counselors. I encourage event producers to set aside a budget for a limited number of counseling sessions for people inside their communities. Publicize a clear path for reporting coercion, harassment, and assault. If people experience these things in your community, who should they tell and how should they do that? Standardized data collection. If someone comes forward with a complaint, have a form or a set of questions that you can ask in each case. Gather information from the accuser, the accused, witnesses, and others whose input may be useful to understand what happened. Examine the claim of the victims and determine if you think that claim and accusation has merit. Designate who in your community is going to make the decision on how to act in response to abuses that take place. When no one is willing to take that responsibility or does not have the backing of the community, assume that nothing will be done and that that person being abused will, do not, will not have any recourse and this will create trauma and pain within the community. This describes what usually occurs when no one steps forward Perpetrators continue to abuse people with impunity. I prefer the model that one person gathers the data and presents a recommendation to a small group of people who then collectively agree on a course of action. Your community may make different decisions about this. When the leader of your community or leaders makes a decision about what to do, they must act with firmness and clarity. They have to assume that during the process, people may attempt to intimidate or manipulate them. This is a very difficult process, especially for women who are socialized to be accommodating and agreeable and retreat from conflict. I think that there should be more opportunities for mediation training and scenario training for people who lead psychedelic communities who have these kinds of difficult conversations, and I would like to lead an effort to do that. Mm -hmm. A few more things. Banishment or restorative justice. Different communities will choose to act in different ways. Some will decide to respond with some form of restorative justice for the accused and the accuser. There are lots of different models for this that you can study and decide which one works best for your community. In the psychedelic community, which has empowered me to help make these decisions, when someone has coerced or harassed someone, we make decisions on what to do on a case-by-case -case basis, considering the facts carefully. If someone has sexually assaulted someone, I prefer the punishment of community banishment in which that person's name is removed from the list of invitations and is placed on a list at the gate or the door with instructions not to admit them. Social banishment is a very old idea. <laughs> Appeals process or no path back. Communities must decide if those who are banished or otherwise punished for their actions can engage in an appeals process or if there is a path back to that community over time. Some communities decide that after a person who has created an abuse is banished or otherwise punished, if they engage in therapy or counseling sessions, they can come back. I myself prefer a system of permanent banishment where the decision is final and there is no path back. That may change over time. I have had lots of these conversations. And in almost every case where we have banished someone, their friends, their family, and sometimes their partners lobby us, they will insist that the person in question is a terrific human being, that they didn't mean it, that they deserve a second chance, that your process is flawed, and that you are a bad person for having to make this decision. Don't take this personally. Set boundaries on these conversations if you need to. Say, for example, this decision is final. I am not going to engage with you about this on Facebook <laughs> or here at this community event. Let's set aside another time to talk. Or perhaps you have decided that you will not talk about this topic at any time in the future. It is your right to make that decision. Defamation and legal matters. Sometimes someone who has been accused threatens to sue you or the victim for defamation. It's helpful to have a lawyer you trust to give you legal advice through this process. 
But if you add a person's name to a list or remove them from a leadership position without putting in writing and distributing publicly why you have done this, you are less likely to leave yourself open to a defamation case. Security and reprisals. There is always the possibility for reprisal against accusers or against mediators or those making these kinds of decisions. I prefer to meet with those accused in person. I have a security protocol for doing this. I prefer to meet in public places. Sometimes I take somebody with me. I always tell at least two people where I am, where I'm going, when the meeting starts, and then I call when I get out of that meeting. This just seems like good common sense. Finally, I want to talk about the role of the shadow in this work. May I have two minutes to do that? Yeah. Thank you. Can we all just take a deep breath for a second? <sighs> Thank you. In the process of engaging with people who have harmed others, you often encounter their shadow, and it requires you to encounter your own shadow. For guidance on this, I consult one of the great female elders of the psychedelic community, Anne Shulgin. Okay. Anne is a lay therapist who has worked with numerous psychoactive substances in therapeutic settings and co-wrote with her late partner, the psychedelic chemist Sasha Shulgin, numerous books, including Call and Call. In Call, Anne explains that the shadow is a term created by Carl Jung. It's our dark side, the beast in the cellar, that's formed in childhood where parents or guides condemn not just a child's action, but the child themselves. This child is not taught to exercise control over destructive thoughts or anger or frustration, but are taught that these instinctual feelings themselves are wicked and shameful, and this instills shame and self-rejection, and the child begins to see parts of themselves as inherently evil. When we don't learn to control our instinctual desires, instead, we deny the very existence of these feelings and create repressed desires that live in the dark cellar of our unconscious, feelings that we sometimes project onto others, and these unconscious desires sometimes fuel abusive actions. Anne Shulgin calls the shadow the beast's survivor. In the psychedelic assisted therapy she helped pioneer, the shadow often takes the shape of a large, powerful animal. She believes that spiritual growth must involve a confrontation in which, together with a skilled therapist, a person gets to know their hidden beast in the cellar and understand its nature. According to Anne Shulgin, the Jungians teach that it is important to encounter the beast and name it and understand how it got there. But they very seldom or almost never take what Anne Shulgin, a psychedelic therapist, considers the next most important action, to step into the beast and look out from behind its eyes, which psychedelic substances sometimes help us to do. When you do shadow work, what you resolve from your personal shadow self can become conscious and become your ally. And you can see other people's shadows more clearly. As Anne Shulgin says, your shadow will never have good table manners, but it is there to protect you. Anne notes that our shadow is also a source of creativity. Wholeness requires that we completely own our own shadows. Once you and your shadow know each other, you can walk with it down dark streets, you know it's available to you when you need it. If you have been brought up to completely suppress and deny your own destructive instincts and to believe that a good person never thinks of harming anyone, when you walk down the wrong street at night and get attacked, you will be less able to turn into your own beast and fight back. You are more likely to become a victim. The survivor part of the beast survivor is accessing the child that you once were who is only concerned with their survival. A person can learn to feel compassion for the innocent child they were and understand how that child and the child within other people developed. This process helps us to have more compassion for others without allowing ourselves to be manipulated. I think it's essentially important in this process of addressing coercion, harassment, or assault, it's important not to be submerged in our own anger and our own trauma. This is especially challenging since the ascension of Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court because this has triggered a lot of anger 
and prompted many people to come forward and talk about their own sexual assaults, which thereby creates more need to resolve these conflicts within our communities. In closing, I think it's important to remember that if you are attempting to de-escalate conflict within your community and have potentially difficult discussions with people, you have to keep your own shadow beast close and try to treat each other with respect and compassion. I've had some very beautiful and very heartbreaking conversations with people about the difficult subjects that I've talked about here subjects that reflect their shadow sides. And those conversations have required a careful balance of ferocity and compassion. But I try to see people in all these conversations as in an entire person, no matter what they have done, and have faith in our collective transformation. I hope these ideas have been helpful to you. Thank you for listening. As the interest in psychedelic continues to expand, as um, access to substances is becoming more and more dangerous, how do we expand the training for people? How do we create a mycelium of networks where people can distribute this knowledge in a way that is scalable? All politics is local. Start at home. Create a community set your community values, empower people to uphold and support those values, teach risk reduction skills within your own community, and work outwards like a mycelial network. Could you say a little more about um, how to decide whether or not to give credence to anonymous accusations? Yeah. It's a decision that every community needs to make for themselves. It's a difficult decision. In our community, we must require that someone bringing forward an acquisition speak with us directly, meet with us personally. We take that information into consideration. If when the accusation is made against the person who has trespassed against that person, we reserve the right to keep the accuser's identity anonymous. We do this for some obvious reasons. People accused will sometimes just reflexively threaten to sue the person making the accusation for defamation. If every accusation is shut down like that, we can address these issues within our community. We have to provide, from our community's perspective, an opportunity for people to make accusations without having their identity revealed to the people who trespassed against them. Each community will need to make this decision for themselves. I've, I've heard some ideas and some people posture the um, option of combining, you know, harm reduction services at festivals and then uh, these like sober um, spaces of, of no like substances um, and kind of combining the two. Have you heard of anybody doing that? Do you think that's possible, like future project that someone could work on? Do you see any potential, like positives or dangers in doing so? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I mean, the, the tea house at, at festivals and events is a sober space. We don't let people use alcohol or other substances in the tea house. If you want to be away from substance use, except for a little caffeine in our Chinese black tea, you can come to the tea house and be in a sober space. Also, I have organized events where we have two meetings a day for a sobriety support group, and I think that's really important. We want to make all festivals, social gatherings accessible and welcoming to people who choose not to use psychedelics or alter their consciousness in any way, or who are in recovery from their use of those substances, and I think that's a really essential part of being welcoming and inclusive. What more could your organization do to take things to the next level and work in the macro realm? Okay, thank you. 
I'd like to make a distinction between sharing information like you're describing on social media as a form of promoting events and, and your values within that event. Look, Facebook is an advertising platform, advertise away. I'm making a distinction between that and trying to solve social issues like this in conversations on social media. Do not try to involve me in your debate on Facebook. I won't do it. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, Annie. So that's the distinction I would make. It's still an opportunity for education and promotion of events like yours, and I commend you for taking those responsibilities seriously and developing your own culture for doing that. We haven't announced it yet, but what we decided to do instead of holding our meetings at retreat centers that were increasingly expensive and were beginning to exclude people who could not afford to go, we are recasting our gatherings in urban environments, making them less expensive, more inclusive. We will be doing one of those gatherings in the spring of next year. You can go to our website for more information about that as it takes place. We have to focus on accessibility, expand this community to people everywhere, regardless of their economic opportunities.